Hey folks, Dave Nodig here, Financial Futurist at Vetify, bringing you this conversation I had with Jim O'Shaughnessy, legendary investor, currently the executive chairman of Stability AI. You may know that from the Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey uh, generative image models. Jim's been a, a real front runner in the AI space for the last decade, honestly. Really fascinated by the ways that machine learning and how we think about data change the process of investing. In this conversation, we really dig into how AI is going to change the global economy, the balance between labor and capital, and how society is going to respond. I found it a fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Cheers. Could you start maybe by <clears throat> Talking about the Great Reset, it's a framing that you first explained to me maybe two years ago, and now you're sort of living it out loud. So can you give us the background of what you mean by the Great Reset? Sure. Well, uh, first we'll correct. I call it the Great Reshuffle. You're using the World Economic Forum's, uh, I think, far more nefarious it, version. It sounds scarier. It does. Yeah. It sounds a lot scarier. I, I think that the Great Reshuffle is essentially been, it really got kicked off Honestly, the beginning nascent part of it got kicked off during the uh, explosion of the internet uh, because it gave us a, the first universal variance amplifier in human history. Um, and it gave us the ability to move our digital zip code far more easily than moving our physical zip code. It gave the internet alone, just on its own, gave people the platform in which they could build communities, they could build like-minded associations, et cetera, with people from all around the world. As you know, cultural lag takes a long time to catch up. And, um, you know, I, I learned that the hard way by trying to form a internet investment advisory service called Netfolio. Uh, in 1999, 2000, uh, boy, I thought I was really. Uh, but at the, the end curve. of the day, you ended up selling canvas. <laughs> you know, indeed, right? So you you got there eventually. We you did. Just had to take a couple tilts at the windmill. And and what's interesting about that is it neatly demonstrates the cultural lag that is inherent in the way we humans adopt things. Um, you've seen the classic adoption curve for technologies and whatnot. Um, that still persists right now. Uh, now it's sped up. Uh, because of a variety of factors that we no doubt we'll get into. But, but the point is, we started then, but not much of anything happened, right? We used it for shopping. We used it for social media. We used it for a variety of those things. But we, we really weren't moving on to the next stage until you started getting, coming online, digital natives, so Zoomers. Um, Which coincides with the pandemic that indeed. became really important at the same time. Indeed. indeed. So is, has the pandemic really been the accelerator of the Great Reshuffle? Absolutely. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, we think that certain of the trends, for example, I have a home office now. We don't have a central office. We have a clubhouse for uh, O'Shaughnessy Ventures, but it, is, it has bedrooms so people can stay there. Uh, it has great workspace so that we can collaborate in person. But um, one of the things that accelerated was the work from home movement. And you know we all see the efforts being made by the companies trying to get people to go back to the office and it's not working out so well. And it's specifically not working out well at all with younger workers right. because they came of age and they have the skills being digital natives to be actually, if you're, in the, if you're a knowledge worker, let's be very clear. Um, but if you're a knowledge worker, you have the skills that you are going to be a lot more efficient, a lot more fulfilled, really, if you don't have to face a two-hour commute each way. And you can then spend that time, take a walk. You and I are big uh, right. advocates of touching grass. And uh, so you, you see the campaign. It's just not working. And, but, yeah, the pandemic uh, accelerated the work-from-home movement. Um, significantly, I would say by as much as seven years. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it, it accelerated the use of these remote style tools that were there, but nobody was really using because they didn't really have to. Right. And, and then when we all started doing Zooms for everything, I, I talked to a banker friend of mine who said their revenues at a very large investment bank, and she said, you know, their revenues went up like 40% because what happened was 
They loved the fact that they could have all of these meetings. They didn't have to get on a plane and go right. to Tokyo. They didn't have to fly out to California from New York. They could just do the meeting. And so what happened was a lot of the senior bankers got back in the game. Well, but this implies that the great reshuffle is going to have some winners and losers in it, right? That's an example of a winning scenario where what was a constraint actually becomes a huge opportunity and a huge accelerant on productivity. We've certainly read the nightmare stories on the other end, companies that have tried to work remote, really struggled in the pandemic, and have brought folks back to, and you know, reportedly to great success, but they're different kinds of businesses. So in that kind of reshuffle, who are the winners and losers and what should investors do about that? So I think um, we, we have to be careful, uh, you know, designating this winner, this loser. Right. Because there's going to be various aspects that work very, very well for certain types of companies where they're detrimental to other types of companies. Um, but really, another part of the great reshuffle is all the old playbooks, all the old models are collapsing. And, and things like when we adopt this more online posture, what becomes important? Authenticity becomes very important. Uh, not trying to bullshit people. Corporate speak, PR speak. People can smell that a mile away. And, and so all of the old tactics of you know, trying to speak in the passive voice, it was decided, right? By, by who? Who decided that? Um, so any kind of hint of inauth inauthentic or kind of weasel words are being judged much more harshly today than they would have been, say, 10 years ago. But to get specifically to winners and losers, well, so, so winners are going to be anyone operating in the real physical world uh, because you're not going to be able to automate a lot. Like if you have a plumbing business... Congratulations! <laughs> you 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 are you right. you're gonna you're, you're gonna a licensed have a massage dynasty. therapist. If you're a licensed <laughs> right. massage therapist or a physical therapist yeah. or any of those uh, jobs, the world is your oyster. Uh, talking to a PT recently, literally, they can pick a job anywhere in the country and improve their compensation, improve their hours, right. improve everything. So, so anyone operating in the physical world uh, in, in terms of those types of occupations, your, your job is not only not going to be threatened, you're going to probably have a great decade. L losers are going to be people who are lower level people doing repetitive work. Like particularly repetitive knowledge type work, Yes, right? specifically like junior bankers. Right. Uh, junior uh, associates. Be beginning actuaries. Yeah, <laughs> beginning actuaries. Ouch. <laughs> and, and, and so people always say, well, what will they do? I, uh, my response to that, and, I, and I'm really not being flipped when I say this, they're going to be removed from this horrible drudgery of having to copy-paste, 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 and hopefully be able to get a lot more creative. Let's take the actuary. Um, if, if they could spend say 40% of their time not doing grunt work and copying and pasting and, and trying to memorize tables, they might have a lot more time to think up different ways that we can use an actuarial right. table, different approaches to that we haven't had right. literally the time Other ways of managing to think risk. about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. New models for risk are going to be emerging from this across all fields. Now, you know, the one I'm most familiar with is asset management. But which I think will there will be a massive impact. For example, my early interest in uh, in AI was when it was still called machine learning, <laughs> because I viewed it as the next frontier for quants. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you the dirty little secret of quants is if you look at all of our underlying models, they're pretty similar, and they're pretty similar because we all had the same data sets, right? Uh, you know, if you're, if you're talking to my friend Cliff Asnes, you know what he trained his, his data set on. It's exactly what I trained my data set on. 
Right. And so your models tend to replicate. Now, of course, they're different in many, many ways. For example, my old company, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, uses composites of factors as opposed to single factors. Some quants still like to right. use a single factor. But that all comes down to implementation, it, exactly. right? I mean, the math doesn't change that much. Exactly, right. exactly. And so I think that you're going to see an explosion of research using machine learning techniques and AI techniques. Uh, in fact, that was my first uh, goal in forming O'Shaughnessy Ventures was going to be a company called Gray Swan. Now, why don't you have that firm right now, Jim? Well, because the compute costs of trying to put that type of firm together um, were going to be you know, prohibitively right. expensive for me. Today, you could probably do it. Uh, to, today, computing. I could probably, with the cloud, yeah. Um, but still not free. Not free. And a crowded field. I mean, the, the asset, people always go where the money is, right? So all of this money in AI has been chasing a lot of finance ventures along the way. Totally. Um, and and we've, we've got great examples. I mean, there are firms out there doing great work on that Kaiju Capital. Like, there's a whole bunch of folks out there doing yeah. interesting AI for asset management work. But your response to your great reshuffle thesis has not been to lean hard into more quant stock picking stuff. That's right. You've actually gone in two completely different directions, one being more generative AI work mm -hmm. and the other being sort of reinventing what it means to be capitalist uh, through a patronage model. Let's start with that last one. You talk about this rise of digital natives being a big part of the great reshuffle. What you individually, I believe, are now just handing fellowships out to interesting young folks that you think are the future. Talk to me about that model. It's pretty unusual. Yeah. Um, I've always, uh, I, and, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to reveal my nerd sources here, but I was rereading Francis Bacon's novel, Utopia. And in it, uh, as you know, it covers Atlantis, the mythical mm -hmm kingdom of Atlantis. And the, the part that grabbed my attention was that they always sent out 12 explorers into different reaches of the earth uh, to see what they're missing, to find out uh, new knowledge, et cetera. And I love that 12. That's why we, have, we started with 12 fellowships. I love it. Historically, a, 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 a brilliant innovator, a genius, could be born, live, and die without ever knowing that they're a genius without ever knowing that they have these, this skill set. Um, and that really for the first time in history is no longer true. Because of the interconnectivity of the world, because of the tools that we have to be able to search for these people, we can find them and we can fund them. And since I believe passionately that free markets are the way to improve world poverty, to improve world health, to improve the material uh, situations that people not living in the United States or Europe are trying to move towards, I think that since we can find them, we must find them and fund them. And we set up the fellowship as a completely strings-free. So we award 12 fellowships a year for $100,000, paid monthly. Uh, but it is not simply to founders or entrepreneurs. What we're, what we're looking for are people who are doing fascinating, interesting work. And by the way, yes, they tend to be young, uh, but we, uh, we, we will accept and, and hopefully fund, like if some 70-year-old comes up with a great idea and they need the funding, they'll, they'll be able to get the fellowship too. But the majority of the people that we're finding are younger. And one of the things that you know when you study things like math and the harder sciences is that there's a real clock on those people. People in those types of endeavors and pursuits tend to do their best work when they're young. Well, certainly if we look at physics, mathematics, I mean, very, very few folks are making their big breakthroughs in their 50s. Exactly. Right? They're teaching in their 50s. Yeah. They made their big breakthroughs in the patent office. You know. <laughs> exactly. And so we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could remove the constraints on a brilliant young person, fund them, and fund them without strings to do their work. So, for example, uh, William Zeng uh, was one of our first uh, fundees. Uh, he's uh, looking to open source quantum computing. And uh, he's a brilliant guy, um, and he made a, lot, a strong proof of work already. Um, and um, the, 
the entire thing was, I love that idea. I love the ability to give a young person who's shown a lot of uh, incredible uh, intelligence around something I think is a, a very important thing for us to be trying to look at. Um, and, and yet, I spoke to you at lunch about um, the other one that we funded contemporaneous with him was a couple who have uh, five children under the age of 10. And they were dissatisfied with the public school options where they lived. And they wanted to do an investigation of alternative education for kids. And they wanted to make a documentary about it. And it just dropped. It's on YouTube. Um, What's it it's, called? It's um, uh, the, uh, the Kids Just Want to Be Free. It's Nat and Martha Sharp. Kids Just uh, Want to Be Free. We, we, can, uh, we can put it in the show notes. But that's such an interesting model because in those two examples, right, the, the gentleman you have working on quantum computing, very easy to see how, oh, okay, in six months, a year, five years, this, this guy is going to land somewhere and do some amazing work, or he's going to go build something, and he's going to need funding. And in all of those cases, I can see a role for you as an investor participating in that process, whether it's just helping connect people with financing, whether it's funding things yourselves, whether it's being part of boards. The other example, though, is really about putting this piece of sort of information, this piece of, it's not really entertainment, it's more knowledge out into the world from the perspective of two parents trying to solve a real, very real world problem that every parent has. There's no payback on that. So, like, do you consider this charity? Do you consider this sort of loose investment? How do you think about it? So, I, I don't consider it charity. Um, I consider it an investment in knowledge. And I've been incredibly fortunate in my life in terms of my ability to build companies that did very, very well. And now I find myself in a place where I get to play any type of game I want to play. And the game I want to play is to only advance win-win deals. Um, and to only, frankly, do business with people who I think are ethical and um, want to play positive sum games. We're, we're kind of at, a, back to the Great Reshuffle, we're at an inflection point. And it can go one of two ways, and, and I, well, it can go more than one of two ways, but two directionally uh, different ways. One is, is open and one is closed. Um, and I have five grandchildren, back to AI. I want the world to not be run by a panopticon. I don't want a few people who say they have my best interests and your best interests at heart to say, trust me. I don't want to trust them. I want open AI. I want AI for everyone because I think it's a remarkable tool that can be used both for good and bad. Let's be very clear about that. But if, if we directionally get it right, and make it transparent and make everyone or give everyone the opportunity to have access to these tools, that's going to make for a better outcome, in my opinion. Um, well, let's, and, take, let's take that hard pivot towards AI. Sure. Um, you, you, you brought it up and, you, and said, you know, can be used for good or ill. I know you're not a doomer on this no. stuff. You, you're, you're, if anything, you may be a little bit Pollyanna on it. Let's talk about both sides of that argument. The Doomer arguments are, uh, to me, largely about control, or they're about uh, AIs actually developing consciousness and free will, mm. which I think is not worthy of discussion because I think that's we, we don't understand what's going on here yet. We have right. ways to go. But the control issues are real. Yeah. Um, you are now involved with, I believe, more than one AI ventures at this point. What do you think is a legitimate concern for the average person in the public to have about A? What should they be concerned about? What should their attention be focused on? I think that, um, that it, the uh, quotidian, uh, for lack of a better word, uses for ill. Um, we spoke about the spoofed voices uh, that older people are getting. AI can perfectly recreate my voice, your voice, we both have um, very easy access. Yes, there's enough of us out there. Yeah, yeah, to get the voice. I have, I don't know, 178 podcasts Probably that they can there. train it on. And so um, there's going to be a lot of scams. And then think, don't think just voice. Think if you got a FaceTime call 
and it looked just like Dave or it looked just like Jim and it sounded just like Jim and you're 90 years old, you're going to probably fall for that. Um, so I think that the, in, in the shorter term, um, again, back to this cultural lag, especially for older people, like they're not quite as familiar with the trends of what's going on in AI. And, you know, they trust their senses. They get a phone call right. from, you know, their nephew Dave who says he's in trouble. Their urge to help is overwhelms. Um, I think that you'll also see a lot of nefarious uses of videos that are fake. Deep fake, like deep politics. Fake. Yeah, yeah, politics, um, corporate espionage, uh, court trying to destroy a competitor. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen on the, on the negative side. Now, I think that, you know, uh, several of the companies I'm involved with are t actively searching for countermeasures against these bad uses of the technology. I like to remind people that, you know, fire, <laughs> fire is responsible for our prefrontal cortexes, I think you know. We didn't cook our food, and so when we started cooking our food, guess what? We got this whole new part <laughs> of our brain that gave us the ability to invent AI. <laughs> but fire is incredibly dangerous, right. right? And so we didn't try to ban fire. We instead created fire alarms, fire departments. We fire stuck it inside exits. car engines. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm not in any way Pollyannish about it or Panglossian about it. I am, uh, uh, I think, very realistic that the, the good uses of AI vastly outweigh the bad. But there will be bad and there will be problems that we have to deal with. And I think trying to deny that is a fool's errand. It's like, then you just, you just don't, you're not, you're not a serious person if you're out there saying, there's no going to be a single problem right. with, with AI. There's going to be plenty. But I but think- But it sounds like you think most of those problems are actually problems with people, not problems with AI. Exactly. Very intuitive. It's, it's technology itself is neutral. It is not good or evil, right? It is the human using that technology, right? And, and you know, nuclear, nuclear weapons, like the, 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 they have one purpose of a nuclear bomb. The only purpose of a nuclear bomb is to kill people and destroy property. That's it. To me, that's a very evil purpose, right? And so when you see comparisons of AI versus, say, nuclear weapons, that, it's completely missing the point. That, the, the, that is a single purpose tech, if you will, that is for, for bad things, in my opinion. Well, I think the example, um, I got into this argument with Stuart Russell about this. The argument he makes is more is around human cloning. Because that one, it's very difficult to say that is purely an evil technology, it would only be used for evil. You can come up with sort of, you know, in, you know, embryonic genetic manipulation and come up with nightmare scenarios, but, mm. you know, it starts turning into Marvel movies with super soldiers <laughs> and stuff like that. But, but again, you know, he would argue that, well, we have international agreements about banning or severely restricting the use of human gene lines in certain applications and that that should be the appropriate kind of model as opposed to the nuclear where it's just like, well, we just make bombs. You know, the manipulation of embryos and human cloning you can come up with a lot of very positive cases, yet as a society, we've sort of made the call to put the brakes on that kind of research in certain circumstances. Do you think that there's an appropriate example like that in AI, or do you think that that's too far of, a, of an approach? I, I think for right now, AI has not risen to that level where we're actually trying to redesign or create new forms of our species. Uh, that's very different, uh, to me at least, um, than, than the what we call narrow AI uses right now. Um, and I think that should we reach a place where those types of questions need to be asked and answered and solved, um, I want to be part of that conversation. I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but you know, just speaking on that issue, um, 
What's going to happen when CRISPR can cure sickle cell? Are people going to argue against that? That's the, the, the challenge. These, these are thornier questions than people sometimes realize at first. Um, there are all sorts of uh, horrible diseases in the world that could be eradicated um, through CRISPR technology and gene manipulation. Um, like, that's something for the most part that I favor. Do I favor unconstrained, unregulated use of these te technologies? Of course not. I think that they should be heavily regulated. I think that they should be, have very bright line rules around what you can and cannot do with that. But I think that the, the, we're nowhere near that yet with AI. I think the, the best way to think about AI right now is as an incredibly powerful tool for the human user. And, and I like to use two of the use cases that I find the most promising. The first is uh, AI tutors. Mm. Uh, we all have very different learning styles. Well, the beautiful part about AI tutors is they train on you. And so they are much quicker to iterate the lesson into a format that resonates with that individual. Yeah. And we've already seen remarkable things. Stability AI got a remit to educate a third of the school children of Malawi. And the early results, let's be very clear, they're early results and we haven't had a formal study done yet. Um, but the early results are incredibly encouraging. The kids who are being trained on the AI tutors are way ahead of the kids in well, the we, and we know we know this about education in general, right? Individual tutoring sho sh shovels off something like five years over the course of a normal educational lifespan, right? Because individualized instruction works. Yes. Like we know this, but we can't do that to everybody. AI theoretically allows us to create individual tutors for everyone. Khan Academy is already starting to do some of this work. I mean, that strikes me as a very now application. What else do you think we're underestimating? in terms of how quickly this is gonna have an impact on our lives? I think that um, the, 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 the unlock here is going to be when there is an AI agent on your cell phone uh, that you get to determine how much of your business that AI agent does a, can- Doesn't know my calendar, doesn't know my contacts. Right, right. but it can if you want it to. It can, and when that happens, everyone is going to immediately enjoy and see the benefits of AI. That feels like it's tomorrow. That does not feel like it's next year. I mean, what's your over under on when, when I don't your think, Sim Jim in your pocket? Yeah, is going to be I don't. Able to... I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's tomorrow. I think it's maybe this year. Okay, so it's soon. It's soon. It feels very soon. Like all the pieces are there. Right. And, and the other thing that I like about it is well, most of us are used to dealing with Alexa or Siri, right? But just imagine Siri actually competent. <laughs> Being good. Being good. And actually able to do and things. Able, and do, do things, yeah. right? Here's a great use case, right? So uh, you and I have gotten together just for fun, and we take a long walk in the woods, and I, as one often does when one is walking, you think of something that you've completely forgotten about, right. and oh my God, it's my sister's birthday today, can you imagine how nice it would be to pull out your cell phone, say, it's Eileen's birthday today, would you find out a perfect gift for her and have the agent go out because it knows Eileen, right? right? And Eileen has recently taken a course in calligraphy and uh, you know, because you talk to her a lot, that uh, she loves it. And so the AI comes back and it says, there's a brand new course on calligraphy in St. Paul, Minnesota, where she lives. And there's a wonderful restaurant nearby. Would you like me to call the restaurant, have a birthday cake made for her, and then enroll her in the class? <laughs> How cool that is would, that? Yeah, yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. And so that type of use of AI, I think is going to be the most ubiquitous. The... the the incredibly useful time-saving things that anybody with a phone can use. And, and I've always been an advocate for AI for everyone in everything. And, and let's take those apart. For everyone. I 
think that is absolutely critical. I do not want a, you know, we already have incredible disparities in income, in assets. We do not need an, a, an intelligence or applied intelligence disparity to emerge. Well, but that, so let, let's jump right into that. How do we make sure that there isn't the haves and have nots? AI is expensive, right? I mean, you look at the, what, what's the estimate? It's like $100 million a month or something like that that OpenAI is spending on compute power just yeah. to keep JetGPT4 running. <laughs> like, the idea that you're going to do that for 6 billion people on the planet for free doesn't seem tenable. So how do we create a, a world where the profit is accruing to the people who've made the investments, like good capitalists, we want that to happen. Sure. But by the same token, we're using the power of some of these tools in a way that's benefiting to all of society. Yeah. Um, so, um, like anything, uh, we're already finding that constrained AI, in other words, much smaller training runs, much smaller models, are actually going to like the model I just uh, described for you. Right. That's actually a tiny model that we already can fit on a cell phone. It works on a cell phone. And, and so that doesn't have that 100 million. That, that, that's what we call big iron. You're hitting big iron uh, for those really complicated in the cloud type solutions. I don't see that as the ubiquitous, ubiquitous way for, uh, forward for AI. I do see a lot of, in fact, we're looking at several potential investments right now in companies that are doing evolutionary style uh, training of AI models, which does not require the heavy firepower, much lower compute costs. And the, you know, there are some other experimental ones that we're also looking at. Now, I'm not saying that all these are going to work, but like anything, what you're seeing is first the, uh, you know, attention is all you need. That paper yep, uh, opened Google. up everything. Yep. Interesting note there, none of the authors of that paper work at Google anymore. <laughs> they either have their own company that doesn't or me at are all. working at a startup. Yeah. But so, so that unlock happened. But now it's, we're seeing a whole host of other ways of training. Uh, be it neural models, be it evolutionary models. There's a whole host, and I don't want to get into the nerdy weeds here, but they're cheaper. They are more, uh, more robust in small tasks. And just to be clear, the task that I outlined for getting the, the, the dinner and right. gift from my sister, that's a small task. Yeah, doesn't, that's an yeah. agent task. Um, so I definitely think that... Um, these models and these much lower cost training will emerge. Um, I also think that um, it will become uh, many of the uses for people like the AI tutor. Um, I, I could see that quite easily being something Apple would love to have on their iPad. Sure. That you're going to give your grandson or your nephew or your niece or your child. Um, so. I definitely see the larger companies like the Apples of the world, specifically Apple or Android, uh, offering those as features. Just giving them away. For Just giving as them part away of the package. as part of the package. Uh, if you look at Japan, for example, um, their, their system there is very different. The telecoms control most apps. And they compete on the amount of uh, apps available on their particular phone, uh, the quality, how next gen it is, et cetera. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that happening, like uh, AI simply being part of an operating system. So it sounds like the real immediate future here is about intellectual property, not capital spend, mm -hmm. right? So good ideas, well implemented, um, and marketing frankly, getting it into the right number of people's pockets. Yeah. Right. So those seem to be the big wins. Neither one of those requires owning all of Taiwan's fabs. No. Right? Like, I mean, those, that's not, this is not necessarily the boom for NVIDIA stock everybody has been thinking it is, if that is in fact the case. If it is intellectual property marketing that yeah. is the next leg up. I, I do think, though, the NVIDIA um, example is, is a good one to bring up because there are use cases that I'm incredibly bullish on that do require a lot more compute. Medical. Medical. Medical, yeah. So that's the other one that I am incredibly bullish on. Um, the mRNA uh, vaccine, 
horrible thing to call it. It's not a vaccine. It's a technology. It's a very powerful technology. And it can be repurposed to other um, uses. So, for example, right now we're very close to an uh, inoculation against malaria, uh, against a variety of other diseases that whole continents suffer under. And, and I, for one, am incredibly bullish on that. The reason I bring that particular platform up is we humans tried to fold proteins for 60 years, never got anywhere. It did it in like six months. Yeah. And so it's those tasks where we humans are not designed to look at uh, an array of 100 million uh, data points, right? Or a billion, doesn't really matter. Once we, humans are, <laughs> humans are not designed to understand the exponential function, right? We, it's pretty we're much- We're very linear people. We're very yeah. linear, right? <laughs> yeah. it, it, our, our math skills are just native, naive math skills are one, two, three, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but AI, it's trivial. And so it can look into what's called liminal spaces and that is incredibly important for things like medical discovery of new drugs, um, combinations of things that we wouldn't have thought of, uh, that can have very wonderful uh, and healing effects, uh, sometimes curing effects. So that's gonna still require a lot of compute, uh, as are the huge kind of national level models. Our anticipation is that every country is going to want their own national model. Um, and we're finding that, for example, it's Stability AI right now. Um, and those are going to require a lot of, a, a lot of big compute. Tell, tell me what you mean about a national model. So a national model, for example, Stability AI just released uh, the first large language model uh, that is entirely in Japanese. Okay. And um, one of the common complaints from the world community has been that AI has been very English-centric, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a fair criticism. Um, and so one of the things that we undertook at Stability was let's make sure that these uh, speak Farsi and speak French and speak Japanese and speak all of the various the same, languages of the world. But it's much more than just language. I mean, I did that criticism of, of certainly ChatGPT4 has been as much about the cultural issues as the language issues. Translated into Spanish, it's still very Amero slash Eurocentric in its references and how it thinks through things because it's, that's the large, large what it's been trained on. When you do a Japanese model, are you relocalizing the training set? Yes. Okay. Very well. Uh, uh, great intuitive jump to that. That's what a national model is. Got it. Okay. A national model trains the large language model or the uh, stable diffusion uh, uh, sets on a very different data set, right. a very different set of cult cultural norms, a very different set of cultural taboos, um, a variety of things that are unique to that particular culture. So does that imply a world where you know, 10 years from now, there are going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these models. And, you know, you might be using the official Japanese model, but you might also be using somebody's renegade Japanese model. <laughs> the, you know, um, maybe uh, is all I can say right now. Um, I, I tend to see this as um, there will be all sorts of the, the part of what you just said that I actually like is I think that there will be very specific agents, if you will, uh, that are designed for very specific tasks. Um, and so there'll be thousands of those. And tinkerers will make them on their own and will keep them on their closed systems. They won't be on the Internet. Right. Um, uh, companies will try to commercialize them uh, and essentially... Uh, get them to be adopted either through an app uh, type sales store uh, or uh, some type of uh, uh, program for a laptop or a desktop computer. So I think that in the normal kind of market sense, you're going to see thousands. Yeah. Um, I don't think that that's going to necessarily be what I mean when I say a national model. 
Um, when I say a national model, that would be kind of your version of the official Japanese um, right. uh, uh, large language model that is good, that hopefully they'll make available to all of their right. citizens. And perhaps other people bake that into then their applications. Using exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I can see um, that. And, and they call it getting hooks into the model when you're designing something that makes use of that right. model. Um, I, I suspect that you'll see quite a lot of that. Well, we've already seen that just in the U.S. in the sort of entrepreneurial bubble around ChatGPT. There's now a hundred and however many thousands of businesses that are effectively just we do a thing and we put hooks into ChatGPT four to give us an interface. Yeah, those right. are those are uh, called wrapper companies. Yeah, um, I, I don't mean specifically the wrapper ones, which those those are a little bit. Smarmy, Some yeah, a little bit, but but no, but there are there are other whole like the, oh, I, I know what you mean, but like yeah, even yeah, like yeah. companies like Adobe are using this oh, technology sure. to make their text to the, video editing better, absolutely, and those kinds of and, things, and right? and we think that's going to be the largest part of the market actually, um, and uh, we think that um, open source is going to be the solution that large corporations prefer. Uh, because large corporations are going to absolutely demand 100% transparency, in, uh, transparency into the model. And if it's a closed model like ChatGPT, uh, the corporation simply is not going to trust well, it. Well, yeah, they can't. I mean, no, yeah, exactly. They can't. Right. And so one of the opportunities that we feel that we are uniquely uh, set up for at Stability AI is we are 100% open source. Uh, but we can still go behind the corporate firewall because it's their model. All we're doing essentially is making a bespoke model, multimodal uh, AI for that particular company. Uh, so it's a bit more like a Red Hat model, if right. you're familiar. Yeah, you know, it's very much like the early open source movement. Exactly. Right. Um, and, and we think that's a massive market because corporations are going to need this technology. Um, they're not going to trust anything that's closed, that their cybersecurity uh, professionals don't have total understanding mm -hmm. of. And so we think that there's a great business model here as well. Uh, but uh, you're going to see, like, th will AI also create a cottage industry? I think so, absolutely. In things like we were discussing over lunch, like I'm an investor in a company called Wand. What Wand does is it's an actual tool, a wand, for graphic artists. And it hooks into their AI resource, and they can use any of the commercially available ones. We have preferences as a company for, for them. Obviously, stable right. diffusion type models would be our preference. Right. Uh, but the thing that's cool about it is it's a tool that graphic artists are quite used to using. And it's physical. And it's physical. Yeah. But what's really neat about it is you draw your drawing, the AI then iterates on it, and then you have a essentially partner, the AI, who iterates your own work with you backwards and forwards until you get to something that you, as the artist, find resonates yeah. with the message that you're trying to do. Yeah, and that seems like that you, we, you, we started this by talking about how you know, the, the best use cases are going to be as a tool for a human, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cyborg or centaur model of this where you're man and machine together. That's obviously a great example of it. We've already seen it in things like in Adobe. You can do context-aware fill, which just all of a sudden makes a background for you with a sailboat in it that wasn't there. right? And, but the picture is still yours. It creates this really fascinating discussion about sort of generative... Uh, ownership and creativity that probably way past where we're going to get to. Yeah, here. yeah. Uh, I do, before I let you go, because I've taken a ton of your time already, I got to ask you one thing. You you have your fingers in a lot of pies. You talk to a lot of people on sort of the front end of a lot of what's interesting in science and culture in the world. What are you most hopeful about right now? What gives you the most hope for the future? I, I think the most hope for the future that I have is that we are at a critical inflection point as a species. And we finally have a suite of tools where we can create what I call the human colossus. And that means an interconnected, loose network that any human can join, add to, hopefully, using the tools that we've been discussing 
to unlock untold human creativity, untold human ability to innovate. We are removing much of the drudge work uh, that humans still have to do, even in knowledge industries. And that will be filled by the ability to generate new ideas, new thoughts about the way things should be organized, etc. So I think that we are right now on the cusp of being able to unlock like a creative tsunami that will make the Renaissance look like a walk in the park. And I'm very hopeful that this is a universal occurrence. Um, you know, bad news just sells better than good. We're designed by evolution to pay much closer attention to bad news, with good reason, right? When the bush is rustling, run away. <laughs> right. We are we are the descendants of the people that, that ran yeah. away. Figure it out if it's a bunny. Um, yeah. But I definitely think that, given the 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 um, not great uses that uh, people might put some of this technology to. I think the, a number of use cases uh, for the flourishing of not only human creativity, but also innovation, discovery, uh, back to medicine. I think we are on the cusp of solving a lot of problems that have been bedeviling humanity for most of our history. And the other thing that I'm incredibly excited about is that, um, back to the fellowships, we can now find people in Bangalore, India, that I would have never had an opportunity to know about, meet, have any interaction with. And not only can we find them, we can fund them. And to me, that ability just lets all of the boats rise as the tide rises. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm like, the other night, I was having a wonderful conversation with my grandson, and I just looked at him, and he was, I was happy about something. He goes, Papa, why are you so happy? And I said, because this is like the best time ever to be alive. <laughs> and I, I really believe that. Well, thanks so much for the time, and I, I hope you're right. I do, too. <laughs> Dude, this is so much fun. It I really was great. appreciate it.